Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about how you can uh, increase your impact when participating in the Facebook Bug Bounty program. So just to give you a bit of background about me, uh, so my name's Jack. I work on the product security team at Facebook in London. Um, before I joined Facebook, um, I worked uh, as a security consultant, uh, and I also was a researcher submitting bugs to uh, the Facebook Bug Bounty program and other programs. Now at Facebook, uh, I help manage the White Hat program, uh, so that involves triaging and fixing issues, uh, and then other product security uh, projects at Facebook. So you can find me on Twitter. It's at uh, fin1t. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'll run through a bit about our bug bounty program, uh, which I'm sure everyone is already aware of. Uh, then I'm going to give some information about how, um, when testing and submitting your report, you can ensure that it's, you know, high quality and triaged quickly. And then I'm going to give some information about some of the false positives and out of scope issues that we receive. And Facebook, uh, and then some good examples of bugs we received in 2016. So the, um, the Facebook bug bounty program, um, I'm sure everyone is aware of what it is, but it started uh, you know, quite a few quite a few years ago, and it encompasses more than just Facebook.com. Included in scope is the Facebook uh, Facebook apps. Um, we also have Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, which was added in 2016. Uh, we also have HHVM and React and some of our uh, other open source projects. Um, so this list um, changes quite regularly. So if you check out facebook.com slash um we'll post any updates to it there. So some statistics for you. Um, our largest payout was $33,500. This was held by Reginaldo uh, for over three years. Um, it was for a code execution issue in OpenID. Uh, this is a super cool bug. And Reginaldo now works on the product security team. But in 2016, uh, this record was actually beaten by, by a Russian guy. Uh, he found another code execution bug. Uh, this was through uh, the image tragic vulnerability uh, that was published last year. Uh, and we paid out $40,000 for this. Um, it's a pretty substantial bounty. And uh, yeah, it was a great bug. So going through the, uh, the top countries, uh, number one is India. Uh, we received the largest amount of submissions and total payouts from India. Uh, this is followed closely by the USA and then Mexico. We've paid out over $5 million in the program um, since we've started, and over 900 researchers have been rewarded. So in a normal day, we receive over uh, 100 reports. Uh, each of these needs to be investigated and triaged. This takes up a lot of our time uh, and can block legitimate re reports from getting triaged quickly. So I'm going to give you some uh, some ways that you can increase uh, your report's impacts um, to make sure it gets triaged quickly. So when you're testing, uh, you may come across uh, some weird situations that are caused by um, logging in, in multi from multiple accounts in the same browser session. Um, so this can be caused by you know, cookies being shared or you know, or your cache. So one of the things that we recommend after you found a bug, uh, you want to retest it in uh, incognito mode and ideally with fresh accounts. So this can it's going to eliminate some of the false positives that, that you may that you may come across. Um, another good thing that you can include in your report uh, is any user and content IDs that are relevant to it. One of the things that we see is that um, specific accounts can have specific features enabled that aren't uh, enabled for everyone. Um, so this can make it quite difficult when debugging. Or you can include the full URLs. Uh, this really helps our investigation can speed up triage quite quickly. Um, so another thing that we that we have on the developer site is the Graph Explorer. So this lets you test uh, API issues pretty easily, um, which is pretty cool, and lets you share the information with us quite easily um, and all the relevant information needed to validate a graph API-based issue. So this is some pretty simple stuff, but um, to get the user ID, this is in the URL, in the ID parameter. Um, if, it's a, if you have a username assigned to your profile, then you need to view the source and copy profile underscore ID. Um, like I said, including these IDs really helps our investigation. Another simple one, uh, photo IDs, this again is in the URL. Uh, album IDs is in the set parameter in the URL. 
Um, one of the things you can do is that for other types of objects that you may need for testing, uh, you just share the full URL if you're unsure which is the correct ID. So for the Graphic API Explorer, this is a, a pretty cool feature that lets you test Graph API and GraphQL issues. Um, you can paste in an access token or generate one for an, an app that you have, um, that you're an admin of. And then you can specify the HTTP method and uh, host parameters and path. Um, and then this will show the output of the response. One of the features that we added uh, last week is a button at the bottom that says uh, copy debug information. Clicking this will copy to your clipboard everything relevant to the to the um, to the API call, and then you can copy and paste this into your report. Um, one of the things this includes is the access token scopes. Um, some of you may be aware, but um, when using the API, access tokens are scoped to specific, to specific things. So it may be a public profile scope or managed pages. Um, so the bugs may be relevant to specific scopes. So let's talk a bit about the false positives that we receive at Facebook. Um, so as I mentioned, we receive um, you know, over 100 reports a day. Uh, and quite a few of these aren't, um, aren't actually legitimate uh, reports. So to, to describe what false positive is, um, we, you know, it's weird or um, atypical behavior. It doesn't necessarily constitute a privacy or security risk, uh, but it may just be, you know, something odd that you come across and you may not you know, fully understand it. There's also a security and usability trade-off. Um, so there's certain things that you, know, you may think are security issues, but actually they're intentional features that, um, or decisions that we've made in order to in in increase usability for users uh, that, are still, that, that don't put, this, put them at risk. And these make up a large portion of our submissions. Um, you know, legitimate reports can get buried under hundreds of false positives, so you know, we want to reduce our volume so your legitimate reports can get triaged quickly. So here's a pretty typical, um, pretty typical example of a bug that we receive. So uh, if you can't read it, I'll read it out for you. Um, so this user has reported that the login form accepts an incorrect password. Uh, so the user writes that in the login form, uh, they can enter their password in uppercase, and they still get logged in. See, at first glance, that may seem like a security issue, but they typed in the wrong password and were logged in. Um, what you might be might be unaware is that for Facebook, the login flow, uh, there's a lot going on in, under the hood that you may not be aware of after entering your email and password. <laughs> um, so we actually accept uh, a few different variations of your password in order to improve user experience. So the first and obvious, um, an obvious one is your password. Uh, this is the one that you uh, entered when you were setting up your account or when you change the password. Um, we also accept a second variation. This is your password, but in uppercase. This can really help users who are on a mobile device um, where they've you know, pushed the caps lock key by accident. We also accept your password uh, with the first letter capitalized. Again, this is useful for mobile, mobile devices, which capitalize the first letter of a word. And finally, we also accept it with uh, an additional character at the end, which can help um, if you've made a typo. So one of the things to, to point out here is that even though we accept you know, four different variations of your password, uh, this is still billions of possibilities. Um, so we, we don't consider it an issue, even though at first glance it may seem like one. So another common issue that we receive is uh, regarding rate limiting. So in this case, the user has reported that when sharing their photo, uh, they weren't rate limited. Uh, they shared it 50 times, uh, and they weren't blocked. Um, so rate limiting, if, if you aren't aware, you know, is one of the key features that we use to fight spam uh, on our platform. Um, so these, these limits can be against you know, various features. They could be against posting a new status or issuing a password reset. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a balance between security and usability. Uh, we want to ensure that users can use Facebook in as smooth as possible, but at the same time, you know, we need to prevent you know, malicious uh, users. So the reason we consider these false positives a lot of the time is that um, there, could, there could be a high limit, um, and the user simply hasn't hit it yet. In the previous example, 
Uh, the user mentioned that they'd you know, posted a photo 50 times and weren't blocked, uh, but the limit could be 100, it could be 200. Um, so this can give the impression that there's, lack, there's no rate limiting applied to a feature, but you know, simply you haven't hit that limit. Um, we also have the ability to tweak these thresholds in near real time. Um, we use an open source uh, Haskell library. Uh, there's a great talk on it. Uh, the link at the bottom, uh, which I'll share afterwards, because it's pretty small, but um, but it's pretty cool, and it means that we can re react to um, you know, malicious events in you know pretty quickly. Um, another thing to point out is that abusing rate limits is very noisy. Um, if you were to issue 10,000 password resets for a user, then you know, they're going to know that something up. Something is up if they receive 10,000 emails. Um, also, ray, limit, ray limiting is only one of the many signals and mechanisms that we use to block malicious actions. Uh, some of these are public um, that you may encounter during testing, uh, and obviously some of them are, are private. So this is another class of issues. Um, this user has reported that there was no X-Frame options header on, on marketing.fb.com. This is interesting because uh, this is technically a vulnerability. Um, lack of X frame options can, can be used for click tracking. Um, so at first glance, this may seem like a real bug. Um, so we actually have a lot of uh, what we call marketing on microsites. These are separate instances which host uh, news updates uh, from various teams. Uh, and they're on a sandbox domain. So what this means is that because they're not hosted on a subdomain of facebook.com, they're usually on fb.com or fbsbx for user-generated content. Uh, this means that if there are, say, like an XSS, uh, it's not going to affect our users uh, where the content is all on facebook.com. These sites also contain little to no user data. Um, they're intentionally uh, pretty bare. They'll just contain you know, pretty static content. Um, so this means that you know, if you were to gain access to to these systems, there's no sensitive information to steal. We also host these on separate infrastructure. Uh, the majority of them are on WordPress VIP. Um, so what this means is that, um, again, if you were to get RC on it, uh, it's completely separate from our production infrastructure. So the systems which do contain user data, you know, our, da our databases and so on, uh, you couldn't escalate to them. So because of these factors, um, the reward amounts are m most likely to be pretty, pretty low or even e ineligible. So when we, when we assess the reward amount, um, we could take into consideration impact. Um, and in these cases, you know, getting XSS on a static, on a static website, there's not much you can do with that other than you know, there's a, a brand risk, and that's it. So that was some examples of bugs that um, that we don't want you to. Um, don't want you to report or to spend your time on. So these are these are some examples of bugs that we saw in 2016. Um, these are some cool issues uh, and examples of ones that we do want to see. So on uh, Facebook pages, um, I'm sure most of you are aware of what that is, but it's where you can create a page for your you know your brand or your band or something like that. Um, one of the features on there is um, messages. So this lets you uh, receive messages from people who liked your page so that you can respond. This is useful if you're a uh, shop and someone's asking a query about your opening times or something like that. So this is a setting in the, in the administration panel for it. Uh, and obviously, this should be only accessible to admins, and only admins should be able to tweak that. Uh, but we had a report in 2016 where it's possible to change this feature for another page. So one of our top researchers is uh, Philippe, the guy from Trinidad. Uh, he reported this bug. Um, and this was actually uh, through GraphQL. So this was um, a bug in the GraphQL mutation. When you change the setting, we weren't correctly checking the page permissions. Um, we re rewarded Philippe $1,000 for this. Um, this is a pretty typical um, you know, uh, permission issue that you may come across at Facebook. So one of the ways this, is, this can be exploited is through the Graph API Explorer. So I mentioned this in a, in a previous slide. Um, you can test 
GraphQL pretty easily with this tool. You can set the um, the path to GraphQL. You can paste in an access token from the Android or iOS app. Uh, and then you specify the mutation and the query parameters. In this case, um, the actor ID parameter uh, was the the page that you're trying to change the setting for. And the page ID parameter, again, is for the page that you were changing the setting for. Normally, we would be checking the permissions to see if the actor ID um, was a page that you had admin access on. But in this case, we weren't. And this would let you change the permission. So this is another bug that we received in, in 2016. This is interesting because um, this is in the admin panel for pages, similar to the previous one. Um, we made some changes in 2016 under the hood to this. Um, code changes you know, very frequently at Facebook. Some of them are obvious changes, like new features. And some of them are completely transparent. You, you, you wouldn't notice that stuff has changed. So this lets you add your friends uh, as an administrator or a moderator to your page. Um, and it should respect the privacy settings of an email address that the user has, assigned, um, user has on their account. But this researcher found a way of disclosing that email address um, through, through the changes that were made to this feature. So the way this worked was that um, adding a user as a, uh, as a page admin by their user ID, it would show them as pending. Uh, because they have to accept the invite first. It would show their email address, but it was shown masked. Um, this is so that it wouldn't leak it. Um, and they hadn't accepted the invitation. Uh, but if you were to remove um, the invitation, this is a link in the admin panel, it would, it would actually contain the full email address of that user. Um, we issued a $5,000 reward for this. Um, this is a pretty significant, um, pretty significant issue and the kind of bugs that we really want to see at Facebook. Just to go over how this would have been exploited, um, if you were to add your friend in the UI, um, when the request is made, uh, you could catch that request in Verb Suite or a similar intercepting proxy. And then you could change this to another user's ID. Uh, the request, uh, with, uh, the, sorry, the invite would still be pending, uh, but the bug didn't rely on them actually accepting the invite. You'd then view the source of, the, uh, of that page, and you could search for the anchor tag that was the remove link. And this email address was just in the, in the parameter. And then one of, one of the things to point out here is that even though the UI showed it masked, hidden in the source code was the full email address. So it's worth you know, looking at the, at the response properly rather than just what's rendered in the browser. One of the features that we uh, added in 2016 um, was adding videos to comments. This is, this is pretty cool. Um, you, it means you can add you know, a video reaction to a post. Um, it's a pretty big feature. So this is a really cool bug. Um, when this feature was launched, uh, we had a researcher who was testing it. Um, after you add the video, um, you could then you know, add someone else's video to your comment instead. This was referenced by video ID. And then, weirdly, after deleting your comment, um, it would actually delete their video as well. This is very unexpected behavior. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want stuff like this to happen. So we rewarded the researcher $15,000. Um, this is pretty, you know, pretty serious. Um, one of the things that, um, the, w the ways to exploit this, uh, you can use the Graph API Explorer again. So you can set the request to the post, which is the 1815 and so on, that's the ID. You can post to the comment endpoint and create a comment yourself. And then once you've created it, you can edit the comment. Um, the attachment ID is the video of Normally, it would be the video that you've uploaded. Uh, in this case, you'd set it to another user's ID. And then simply issue a delete request to that endpoint. Uh, and this would delete the comment and cascade down to the video. Um, so what's interesting is that this bug doesn't actually end here. <laughs> after, the, after the blog post was written, uh, about a week later, we received another report, which was pretty, <laughs> pretty much identical. So this is pretty weird when this happens, because um, it makes us assume we haven't fixed it properly, but actually this was in a completely different um, different area of Facebook. It just had the same bug. Um, so this was attaching videos to uh, uh, event posts and then deleting the event post. Um, and it would do the exact same thing. It would cascade and delete the original video. Uh, we were rewarded Dan uh, $10,000 for this bug. Um, it was great uh, and the kind of stuff we wanted to see. 
One of the other areas of Facebook that some people think uh, don't think about testing is Business Manager. So business.facebook.com, you may you may have seen it, is um, is our portal for managing uh, pages, adverts, advert accounts, and that kind of stuff. Um, so one of the bugs that we had in this uh, in this product uh, was an insecure direct object reference bug, pretty pretty classic one. Um, this would let you take over another user's page. So when you when you have your pages in Business Manager, you can grant access to these pages to an external agency. Um, this is useful if you have you know, you've outsourced someone running your adverts for you, that kind of stuff. Um, normally, the flow would be to add someone to your page. In this case, you could change the page ID to someone else's, uh, and this would actually make you an admin of their page. So this was a missing permission check when claiming the page. Um, so we rewarded the researchers sixteen thousand dollars for this, uh, and this is a pretty typical example of um, the style of bugs which have the highest impact of Facebook. You're, you're less likely to find an XSS or a CSRF. Uh, at Facebook, uh, we have some very good frameworks for protecting against that, um, but the privacy and permission models of Facebook are very obviously very complicated, uh, and we have a lot of code changing frequently. So we, um, you know, these reports really help us find those kind of bugs. And just to run through the exploitation, you would add a partner to your business. Um, you'd send a post request to business share slash asset to agency. And you could change the asset ID to another user's page ID. Uh, when you refresh the page, then you would see it added to your business, even though you didn't have access. And then you could simply do whatever you want to that page. So some of the, the pro tips to help you and find these kind of bugs. Um, one of the main things is looking out for new features uh, which may be less heavily tested. Um, so the business manager feature, not that many people know about it, and there was a great bug in that. Um, also the video deletion bug, uh, this is in new features, again, which are less heavily tested. Um, reading our tech blogs and our Facebook page posts um, let you find out about these new features when they're launched. Another trick that you can use is checking for similar known issues. The deletion bug, uh, the reason we received a second report was because the researcher, you know, he read another researcher's blog and he saw that there was this kind of issue. So he decided to try it out on other areas of Facebook. And as I mentioned, don't test just www.facebook.com. Uh, the email address issue was, was found in m.facebook.com. This again is less heavily tested. We also have our Android and iOS apps which again, they interact with the Graph API, so there's some great areas to look for bugs in. Checking the HTTP responses of page source can find, um, can let you find snippets of information which isn't shown in the UI. Um, so it's a great way of you know, making sure there's no information in it. So some of the resources that we have is the bug bunny page. Uh, we post updates there, uh, changes to our scope, that kind of stuff. We also have the general Facebook security page, which is Protect the Graph. Um, this has some really interesting stuff about our open source projects that we release, which are also in scope for the Bug Bounty program. And one of the researchers in our program, Philippe, he maintains a Facebook note of all of the publicly disclosed Facebook bugs. So this is pretty extensive, and it's a great way of finding out what bugs we've had in the past and what kind of um, examples of the style of issues that we have. Um, one thing uh, to highlight, um, so after this talk, make sure you enter the CTF flag, uh, narcombountycraft.com, um, to get your 25 points for, for attending this talk. I'll leave that slide up and uh, see if anyone has any questions. <laughs>